السلام عليكم ورحمة وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا قائد الغر المحجلين والشفيع المذنبين وسيدي وليلي ألم ونفخ محمد عبد الله الهاشمي القرشي وعلى آله وأصحابه من ولا ثم أما بعد So uh, thank you uh, شيخ مسلمة for uh, and the Majlis for agreeing to facilitate and host uh, this program or this set of sessions called Beautify Your Home. Uh, as I heard, some of you may be joining us for the first time and, and missed last week. Uh, fortunately, alhamdulillah, we have the recording, so uh, you can watch them out of order. It shouldn't make a, a huge difference, but I, I recommend that if you um, find benefit in this session that you go back and listen to uh, the first one since we're kind of trying to build uh, concepts uh, one on the other and just briefly we had mentioned uh, last week this idea of beautifying the home and home here we mean something that is uh, meaningful and conceptual not just physical uh, and you know we said about the home that this is the place where you likely especially in the age of COVID spend most of your time uh, this is the place where you sleep this is the place where you eat this is the place where uh, those closest relationships that you have in your life and likely for the rest of your life are going to be and are going to be formed and are going to develop. Um, what you do at home uh, will influence what you do outside of the home. Uh, the manner by which you exit your house, the manner by which you enter your house, all those things um, will have direct effects on you and it will have direct effects on the people around you. It will have direct effects on the people that you deal with outside of the home. So, uh, and we went through some verses of the Quran that you, you can listen to in the last session that we talked about um, that all kind of uh, underline uh, this very important idea of the home, al uh, bayt or al manzil or al maskan. You know, even the different words that we use in Arabic, they each give a little bit shade of meaning, right? So, bait, makan al mabit, the house is the place where you spend the night. Bata yabitu, mabitan. Al manzil, makan al nuzul. So, this is the place where, after you've been doing whatever you've been doing outside, then you come back and tinzil, uh, right? You you descend into this place. Al uh, maskan, right? Min al sakina, or makan al sukun. So this is the place of stillness, right? And you can also infer from that this is the place where you would recharge uh, and, um, you know, get ready to continue with life and continue on with another day uh, and the next day and the day after that and the day after that and so forth. So um, the home also is the building block of the community, of the society, of the neighborhood. You don't have a neighborhood without homes. Um, and you don't have... Um, a home without the people who, who make up the home um, and the individuals who, who comprise that home and the relationships between those individuals. And so you can't really build culture, you can't build societies, you can't build neighborhoods, uh, you can't change cultures except, and I firmly believe this, via uh, change in the home or stability in the home or uh, all of the things that we want to see happen in the neighborhood, all of the things that we want to see happen in society, all the things we want to see happen in the greater culture, they have to begin in the home. And I think um, one of the challenges we're contending with is I don't think a lot of people think about that. Um, a lot of the promotion for change, let's call it, uh, that people are trying to do, rarely do they focus on the home. Most of the time they're looking at the, you know, the macro aspect of it, like on the big scale. Um, you know, how do we change this, this government? Or how do we change how this government behaves? Or how do we change how the culture behaves towards a certain group? Um, but if, if you don't instill the, the values and the ethics and the morals that, are need, that need to be instilled on the level of the home, where they actually they are best to develop and best to, inco to be inculcated and, and to be learned, then it becomes very difficult to do something uh, uh, outside of that. So families are extremely important um, and families reside in homes. So we could have also called this beautify your family. Um, but not everybody 
lives in, in, in the typical family, but most people at least have a place where they, they settle down and they call home. So that's kind of, um, you know, the, the, uh, the take that we were, we were looking at. So um, what I had done last week, and I believe where I left off, the approach I'm going to take, we're going to do eight of these sessions, inshallah, is Ahyan Allah. So probably ending towards the beginning of Ramadan, uh, or right before the beginning of Ramadan. And we're going to look at three areas, three main areas. So I actually structured them like a house. I did send a PowerPoint picture out. I don't know if you received it. But think of the, the bottom or the foundation of the house which, uh, or the home, which you don't see. But nevertheless, you wouldn't have a home without it, but it forms the foundation. So if you're walking down the street and you're looking at people's apartments or people's homes, you don't really see that physical foundation. And you don't see what, what I'm not really talking about as a physical foundation, but is the spiritual foundation. So I call that the personal spiritual foundation. So in order for you to contribute to your home in whatever role you may play, right, you may be uh, a husband, you may be a wife, you may be a, a parent, or you may be a child, or you may be someone else. But everyone is going to have a particular role, but you won't be able to fulfill that role, I think, uh, in the best contributive way unless that foundation is built within you first. So this is what we're going to be focusing focusing on, which we focused on a little bit last session, and and all of this session, and maybe a little bit of the third session as well, looking at that personal, spiritual foundation. Then when we focus upon that, then we can think about well, how do I bring my personal foundation and then bring it into a shared space, right? Again, that space is physical, definitely in a home, but it's also uh, meaningful, not just in a physical sense. So, you know, you may be sharing space physically with another human being, but that shared space um, transcends and goes beyond to a shared spiritual space, if you will. So your mood, your, your words, um, your vibe, you know, you live long enough with somebody and you pick up on their vibe, you know, in kind of the vernacular of today, but, uh, you know, we would call it hal, right? You know, and people used to say things to each other, and they still do, like, كيف hal, right? And that's kind of a very spiritual way of looking at things, like, how is your state? Uh, or خلي بالك, right? خلي, خلي means empty out your bad. Your bad means your spiritual state, you know. R rid yourself of hem, rid yourself of, of, uh, of worries and anxiety. خلي بالك, you know. Nowadays, people say it when, like, you're about to hit a pedestrian in the street or something <laughs> in Cairo. But the original meaning behind it is خلي بالك, you know, like just uh, empty out um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, whatever worries and anxieties and so forth. Um, and so like having the, the pulse of other people around you, um, this sort of intimacy, is probably something a lot of people are uncomfortable with today and maybe shy away from. And uh, we tend to wear masks, haha, -ha, no pun intended, COVID, but even like meaningful masks, you know, masks that were, were hiding. Uh, so we're wearing masks before COVID started. So the, maybe the physical mask was just an affirmation of the mask we were already wearing. But I don't want to get too esoteric with everybody. But um, so the, the, the mask um, is we're, we're loath to share kind of that sort of, of, of you know, it, because it, we feel vulnerable when we do that, right? When we kind of like let people see us for who we really are. So we tend to put up these facades. Uh, and that's difficult to do in a home, people you're sharing that space with. Um, and if you attempt to do that while you're in the home with people who are supposed to be close to you, it will introduce a level of stress into your life, I think, that uh, will not be lifted unless you recognize first, like, wait, if I can't be myself here, then, you know, or can't be me, or I can't be someone who lets their guard down in front of, you know, the people closest to me, then who can I let my guard down in front of? Uh, and that's important, because human beings, we, we crave intimacy, and it's important for our own well-being, spiritual, physical, emotional, psychological, so forth, um, to be able to, to do that. And the home is where you learn to do that, right? Uh, children who grow up in a home where the, the parents don't show that, or they don't know how to do that, then they grow up and be adults who don't do that either. So uh, it's, uh, I don't mean to kind of 
belabor the point, but really, it's 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 uh, we can't put enough emphasize it enough enough. You know, we can't highlight it enough uh, the importance of of these factors. So this the shared spiritual uh, environment then is people are going to pick up on you know on your vibe on your hal and actually um, this is where positive vibes positive ahwal also can be. Um, transmitted from one person to the next um, and and you know we look at the the, the the generation of the Sahaba of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they felt that way about the Prophet Sallallahu just being in his presence right was like a life-changing transformative experience um, that would you not be the same even for however fleeting that uh, that uh, the, that meeting was and and hence you know, the ulama say that if a person met the Prophet ﷺ even once, saw them, uh, shared space, like saw each other, uh, then they are Sahabi, then they're a companion. So they could have been someone like Abu Bakr Siddiq, who knew the Prophet ﷺ very intimately all his life, uh, even before Nubuwa, even before Prophet. And then there are some of the other, um, you know, tens of thousands of Sahaba who didn't know the Prophet ﷺ that well, but met him once. Maybe they came in the ninth year, Am al Wufud. The, the year of delegations, and they came and saw him and said two words, and they went back to their their place. But they're a Sahabi, right? Because that that in and of was 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 transformative. And I think I mentioned here last week. Once some people, someone asked a question about, you know, activities. What are the activities that we do? Activities in the house, and uh, one of the things I want to also stress is that sometimes we just need to share space, doing things that people just do like sharing meals, like eating, like just sitting down together in a living room and having a conversation. That in of itself is an activity. But since we're, we're so activity focused, right, we're, we're looking up all the latest studies about, you know, what activities you should do with your children and, and, and how often and these sorts of things. And we feel like if we leave time that's unscheduled or, or unstructured is a better word, if we leave time that's unstructured, then somehow um, you know, there's something wrong with that. And actually, no, I think me, to me, the marker of a good home is how do you spend your unstructured time, right? What, what, what do you do? Is it natural? Is it composed? Is it balanced? Is it beautiful, that unstructured time, just, you know, being with in another's company, just speaking, asking about one's day or preparing meals together or sharing meals or, you know, helping each other on some task that the other may have to do? Rather than this, um, I think, aggressive pressure to always feel like to be on and to, and to do something uh, that's activity-based, that's going to somehow, you know, be added to the overall uh, meter by which you measure your, your success in life. And I think it's not a good model uh, to follow. And, and one of the things I want to talk about also is slowing things down. I'm going to talk about intentionality a little bit. And sometimes we just need to slow things down by pondering and contemplating, why am I doing this? And if I'm doing this, let me think of a good reason why I'm, I'm going to be doing this, or good reasons why I'd be doing this. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So shared uh, spiritual environment. And then at the top, you know, with the top of the house, second floor, uh, would be our relationships. So how do we navigate? How do we negotiate the shared space? And I'm not just talking about who gets first access to the coffee machine in the morning. That's a negotiation, obviously. Um, I know about that. But also, uh, the relationships in terms of you know, parents to, to ch children, siblings with one another, uh, neighbors, people who come and visit to the house, uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, struck me, uh, my family and I, we spent most of our adult lives, actually, not in the United States, in other countries where there was more of a communal um, sort of uh, way of doing things. And, you know, when we came back to the States several years ago, I was kind of a little bit um, bewildered, not bewildered, but just found it interesting that people here, even the way that we visit one another is very structured and we sent, set up. Maybe I'm just old, too, so I, uh, let's caveat that. And we have Eventbrite, you know, like setups for like when we can visit one another, and we have to schedule that. And 
I recall that we would just, you know, if I wanted to see somebody, I go and knock on their door. If they're home, they open. And if they're not home, I go back. And um, this was even before cell phones, I recall this, and even a little bit after cell phones. Um, and there was kind of a natural feel to it. Um, also, we won't get to in this class, maybe we do a follow-up class that's called Beautify Your Community, or Beautify Your Neighborhood, or Beautify Your Mosque. Maybe it'll be a series, we'll see. But to create spaces where we can naturally do that, where we can meet up. One of the challenging things about living in uh, advanced, developed, whatever you want to call it, Western societies, is the outside space has been very much commercialized and commodified. So if you want to meet up, okay, let's meet up for coffee. Okay, that means we're going to go somewhere and spend money, all right, which is a place that's commodified. Someone else set up that space to make a profit. It's not really just a public space um, or for a meal or for or at a restaurant or share an experience like watching a movie together. So these are the kind of things people tend to like get together with. Um, whereas uh, in more traditional societies, you had more spaces that people would naturally get together. Um, you know, it's almost cliche, but the study that they said about uh, women who used to live in villages, um, before they got washing machines, they would all see each other down at the river where they would wash their, you know, they would designate a day of the week and sometimes they'd meet up and, and, and they would wash their, their wares and their clothing and all that sort of thing at the river. So it was kind of very much a communal experience. And then the washing machine comes into play and more people can afford it and then they're just sitting in a house, put their load in and then just wait, but then they're not meeting with their friends. So they're kind of isolated um, in the house, which was kind of a byproduct of that particular piece of technology. And we're going to talk about technology uh, also in, this, uh, in these sessions. But um, so these kind of natural spaces that, that were there and that came out of, I think, a, a deep and profound understanding of, uh, of the deen, of Islam. Uh, and you found the, the, the mosque, the masjid was at the center. And, you know, think about it five times a day, people are coming together and seeing one another. Not just seeing one another, there's actually physical touching, right? You're lining up uh, in prayer um, five times a day. You know, you don't even have to uh, check up on people that way because, and, and, I, and I lived in, in a society like this, when someone didn't show up for Fajr prayer or so for Aisha, and they know that he's a regular, then we'd all go and visit, go to his house and see if anything's wrong. Right? Are they sick or they need something? And, that sort of thing. And so that was kind of a very natural way for these cohesive bonds, um, I think, to, to develop. So yeah, I mean, uh, it sounds a little nostalgic, but I think also we have to think about how do we not do it exactly the same way? That may not be possible, but how do we kind of introduce these more natural ways, let's, uh, or to use the term of today, organic ways by which we can, um, we can come together and be together and uh, enjoy each other's uh, sohbah, right? Just like the, the companions enjoy the sohbah with the Prophet and by virtue of just being with him, um, then we also can, can find some of that, inshallah. So let's look at specifically what we call virtual, uh, personal spiritual foundation. So one thing that I recommend for everybody is you know, if you walk into um, an interview uh, for a job and the cliche question that they're going to ask you is like those three questions. Uh, why do you want to work here? And um, tell me about a situation that was difficult and how you got out of it or what you did in that thing. And then they'll say, uh, where do you see yourself five years from now? So I think also spiritually we have to think about, well, where do I see myself not just five years from now, but like tomorrow or the day after or, or next week. And it, it means you need to have a little bit of a plan or uh, a methodology for improving yourself uh, on a spiritual level. And you may say, well, don't we already have that? Don't we pray the five times in the day? And don't we pay the zakat? And we go to hajj when we have the chance and we go to umrah. So isn't that kind of already built in uh, in the deen? I would say yes and no. Yes. Certainly, uh, Allah did not make those things obligatory except so that he does give us those built-in things. But also, 
um, it is quite possible to still be doing those things and be stagnant spiritually. So there has to be an ash, right? There has to be a type of invigoration of your spiritual state by always looking to do something better, to get closer, right? At taqarrub ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iktisab rida Allah, earning Allah's uh, contentment with you and um, finding yourself uh, closing the gap, which is not a physical gap, but a, a spiritual one that is encompassed by your ego, basically, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So closing that gap between you and God also should be uh, uh, one of those goals. And so we need to think about, well, what am I doing for that? Am I actually doing anything specific? Or am I just going through life on autopilot and, you know, just moving from one thing to the next and doing kind of the standard expectation uh, that people have of, you know, increasing in acquisition uh, of things and stuff and wealth, getting a bigger house and a nicer car and saving enough for my children's uh, schooling and college thereafter, getting them married and then going on retirement or, you know, somewhere where it's sunny and warm and I don't have to deal with winter and then die. And you could still be doing all of those things, but that's not really what you're doing. You know, that's like outwardly it looks like what you're doing. But inside, right, you, you actually have this program. You know, are you reading, are you still reading the same surah every day in your prayer? Like, do you read just like the last three or four surahs in, in, the, in the Mus'haf uh, every day? And you're not actually trying to do something different? Um, you know, the, the Qur'an is 114 surahs because, you know, every... Surah, every chapter in the Qur'an, will give you what we call a type of talween, right? Talween, which means a coloring of your soul that another surah will not. So think of yourself as um, ideally an empty vessel that has colorless liquid in it, water. So your ibadat, the acts of worship that you do, the surahs that you read, the verses that you read, the intentions that you have, all of these things, because they are varied, they give you a different talween. They give you a different lone color, right? a spiritual color. So you introduce greens and reds and purple and violet and yellow and all these sorts of things. Um, but if, you still, if you're doing the same thing over and over again and not changing anything and not trying to do something different, then you become stagnant and then it becomes like a gray. So you still have a color, but it's not really colorful. It's just, you know, you've, you've, you've deprived yourself of what's, of what's really there. And that's why we believe in every single aspect of whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has us to do or obligated us to do or recommended us to do, there is a talween. The ruku' is different than the sujood. Reading the fatha is, is different than reading surah qul hu Allahu ahad. Um, saying assalamu alaikum is different than saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Is different than saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Saying subhanallah is different than saying alhamdulillah, is different than saying Allahu Akbar, is different than saying la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Each one of these things gives you talween, right? It gives you in a particular spiritual color for you. But again, in order to, to properly benefit to the maximum, to the utmost, in the best way, uh, you have to empty the vessel first. It has to be clear liquid is dealing with. If you're already colored with your dhunub, right, with your sins or with your trepidations, with your anxieties, with your hang-ups, um, then that talween is gonna, not going to find a place where it can easily be dyed into the, the base that's you. It will find difficulty in doing that. So that's why they say, التخلي ثم تحلي ثم تجلي. So تخلي means to remove all of those uh, imperfections as best as you can and vices and shortcomings and hang-ups what tahalli that's the talween right is bringing in all of these beautiful things that will beautify your soul and then you will have tajalli and tajalli is to see Allah as he truly is as you can as a human being right yatajalla rabbuka bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi wa dhatihi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he's manifesting himself everywhere all the time but now you'll have the ability to perceive it and see it. Ta'abudullah ka annaka tara. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. Allah zukna dhalik insha'Allah. So 
we, we, we have to do that. It's, I think it's important, and everyone should be thinking about that. But more specifically, and this is not a, a course for that, we have other courses on the YouTube that kind of deal with that specifically. But here, we're just going to touch upon what I think are kind of um, the major aspects, especially as they relate to the home and relationships. So um, I want to talk about time management. And I want to talk about accumulation slash acquisition management, you know, the things that you buy. And I want to talk about anger management. So all those things, you might have heard them in a different context, but they very much squarely relate to um, this, this issue of the home and how to beautify the home. So time management. It's interesting to me that um, Muslims started talking about time and its importance way before all these time management courses that people are talking about. I remember back maybe in the late 90s, um, time management was really a big deal and all corporations were paying for people to do a time management class. I remember I was working uh, at a job in, in New York City and they sent us on a course for one or two day and this so-called um, um, brown breaking and novel way of managing your time and they handed us these thick diaries like this big and that had different color tabs and it was a way to kind of you know help you manage your time and, and so forth because that was what's going to help the corporation and you know for you to be the most efficient and productive employee and then maximize the profits of whatever company you're working for um, but Muslims talked about that a long time ago uh, Imam al-Shafi, he said, I, I spent company with the Sufiya and I learned two things from them. Al-waqtuka saif, wa nafsuka illam tajghilha bil khayr shaghalaka bil sharr. He said, I, those were the two really important things I learned from them. He said, time is like a sword. And then there's a takmila, there's a sec addendum to that. In lam taqta'abi fa huwa yaqta'ak. If you don't cut with it, it cuts you. So that's how time is like a sword. Either you're using it or it's using you. Either it's um, you, are, uh, you are lording over it or it lords over you. That's how time works. And then the other thing that he learned, which is also very important, uh, your soul, if you don't busy it with good, it will busy you with evil, which is somehow also related to time, I think, as well. Right? So to, to be busy with good. Uh, and they had this concept of ta'mir al-waqt. Ta'mir al-waqt. And tu'ammir waqtata bil khair. Right? Ta'mir means to, like, to build, to occupy. So occupy your time with good. Occupy your time with khair. Occupy your time with khidmah, right? with service. So um, this is one of the most challenging things, I think, today for all of us. Um, for societies that seem that we have so many of what used to be mundane tasks that... Uh, you know, hitherto took like days to do or much work to do, simple task of washing your clothes, right, uh, of procuring your daily bread, like actually getting food, um, of uh, uh, tending to, you know, your, your, your needs in terms of basic necessities. These things have been vastly facilitated. Literally today, you don't have to leave your house at the touch of your smartphone. You can order anything, and it could be, if it's food, it could be at your door in minutes. And if it's something that, like, um, you know, even bigger than that, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a snowblower, you can get it in 48 hours from Amazon. So, uh, so facilitated, so easy, right? And, and all of the things to do your proper research, if you want to, about this thing that you want to buy, uh, also been facilitated. You know, versus just a few decades ago, you know, you could probably spend a weekend looking for that snowblower, going to different stores back and forth and that sort of thing. But now it's all facilitated. Now people are even buying homes in, in the age of COVID from far away because they have like a, a virtual walkthrough or a virtual showing uh, of the house. But yet, it seems like we don't have enough time. And it seems like everyone complains that, you know, we're always <clears throat> short on time even though we have so many of these modern convenience features that help us to spend or free us for to do time or to spend our time with things that are better to do. And that was kind of the promise of, of many of these technological advancements, that it will free you up to do the things that are more important in life. 
But what has actually happened, I think, is the technology itself has occupied your time. The nature of some of the technology, and I'm going to talk about technology, um, has sucked you in so that it actually robs you of your time. And, and we know this from you know, the smart devices and the phones and, the, and, and then the applications that can be run on it, social media and so forth. Um, so it seems like um, we are constantly distracted. And I think we all know this on a very basic intellectual level. We don't deny it. We're quite aware of it. But we often seem helpless to do anything about it. That's the challenge. Um, first thing I would say is don't blame yourself too much. These things that are grabbing our attention were designed by people who know the human psyche in and out so that they do exactly that. They constantly grab your attention and do not let go. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and Jeff Bezos and um, all those guys, they don't care about our physical well-being. They care about the bottom line, as it were, making profits. So if you were to spend uh, 12 or 14 of your working hours on Facebook, Facebook is perfectly fine with that. They don't have any issue. There's no warnings that are going to be issued on the screen that will say, uh oh, you spent too much time on Facebook today, time to, or Instagram, time to kind of take a break, let go, that sort of thing. That's never going to happen. Well, I shouldn't say never, but hasn't happened uh, as of yet. So there's no issue with that because you indeed, you're the product, right? You, you, what, what Facebook makes money off is you, your likes, your, 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 um, your clicks, and, and, and then the advertising then algorithmically is sent to your way. That's the whole thing. And I, I think I read the, the phrase, if you pay nothing for something, right, of a service, then know that you're the product, right? You're, you're, you're paying yourself, you're paying your soul, basically, um, for that service. So it's not for free. It does cost something. So um, then the issue then becomes, don't blame yourself too much, number one. These, de these things are designed to suck up your time. Number two, know that you have limited attention energy. Your ability to pay attention to something or anything is limited. And you may feel that it becomes even more limited as you grow older or as you become more sucked into some of these applications. Um, so then you have to have priorities and where you're going to put your attention energy. So pay it, uh, I read in a recent article, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. So treat it as like you would treat anything that you consume. So if like you're, you're, you're watching your, your food, your diet, and you're looking at the calories and, you know, that's too many calories, I'm not going to take that, or, or I'll eat this, and this is the right number of calories, you should also think about in terms of your attention span. Uh, if I click on this article um, about, uh, I don't know, this Hollywood celebrity and their most recent divorce, uh, it may take me three minutes to read, but in terms of my attention energy, right, if I was at like 56% before that, and then it takes me three minutes, but then it zaps me a little bit, and now I'm down to 52%, is it worth it? So that click, it may seem harmless, and it may seem like a meaningless distraction, but actually it, it kind of it, it takes away from you. And you don't really realize how much it takes away from you until you leave it. Right? While you're inside the bubble, while you're inside the, you know, the, the so-called distraction zone, let's call it, um, you can't see what it looks like outside of the distraction zone. But if you pull yourself out of it, then you're looking back at like, what, what was I doing? You know, like, there's so, much, so many better things I could be using my time with than that. So removal avoidance of distractions is very important. So that means how you structure your time is important, and also how you deal with your unstructured time, because we talked about unstructured time as well. So your unstructured time also should, there should be a methodology to it. Um, you know, we can't always be like, let's say, on all the time, uh, even in terms of worship. Uh, no one expects anyone to worship, you know, 24-7 and you know, to be in a constant state of physical worship. Uh, even the Prophet ﷺ did not do that. And he criticized those who tried to do that. And, and three, there were three young men. One of them was even Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu. And they said, we're not going to marry. We're going to be celibate. And all of us, most of us heard of this before. And one said, uh, I will pray the night and I will never uh, sleep. 
And the other one said, I will fast every day and not break my fast. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, because they wanted to be like the Prophet. That, and the backstory to that is, why did they want to go to that extreme? Well, they said, for us to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially in paradise, how are we ever going to reach that level unless we go to this extreme? So it was their love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that drove them to it. But nevertheless, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told them, أَنَا أَتْقَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ وَأَخْشَاهُ أَنَا أَتْقَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ وَأَخْشَاهُ I have the most taqwa out of all of you, and I have the most khashya, fear mixed with love, khashya, out of all of you. وَمَنْ رَغْبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلِيْسَ مِنِّي Right, in another hadith. And this is my sunnah. So he said, I marry and I, uh, I sleep at night and sometimes I pray. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi slept some of the night, sometimes he'd sleep in the duha time after the daybreak. Uh, sometimes he would take a nap in the afternoon. He slept. And even the companions mentioned how we heard, we know he would be asleep because we can hear him, his breathing as a sleeping person. Uh, and he said, I don't fast every day. Some days I fast and some days I do not. Yes, he fasted Mondays and Thursdays. All the time? No, not all the time, most of the time. He fasted a lot of days in, in, in Sha'ban. Uh, and sometimes he didn't. And Aisha would say, sometimes I'd see him fasting so much like I thought he would never stop fasting. And sometimes I'd see him not fasting that I said to myself, he's never going to fast. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi there was a dawma to it, as described also by Aisha. Dawma means there was a consistency, right? Not, wasn't perpetual in a sense like every day the same thing, but there was a consistent practice, right? So in terms of our ibadah, our acts of worship, we want to do things consistently. Um, so this moves into the the second thing that I want to talk about in terms of um, time. I call it the litanization of time. That's not a word, but I made it up. Um, I don't know if that's okay, but I know the word litany. So I, I, what I meant by that is to make your time a rod. So the wird is a concept that you find uh, mentioned in the books of spiritual uh, purification and other books. Uh, wird in the language, Arabic language, originally means uh, a watering hole of an animal. So that the animal would go there. So what's the connection between watering hole and, and wird, something that you do as a litany, in other words, consistently? The relationship is that the animal goes to the watering hole daily or consistently. It can't survive, right, if it lives in the African savanna uh, and it's a, a wildebeest or a zebra or whatever it is until it, it goes consistently, maybe not every day, but certainly several times a week to drink from the watering hole. So for us, our uh, spiritual, uh, yeah, our spiritual uh, nourishment has to come from this spiritual warring hole that we call the Wird. The Wird. So, some of these things ha are built into our time already. Like what? The five prayers. Nothing is more evident of how important time is than the five prayers itself. Even the Quran says so. In the Salata Kana Ad al Mu'mina Kitaban Mawkuta. Kitaban Mawkuta. Mawkut min al Waqt. So the, the prayers, kitaban here means it was prescribed, mawqutan, in its prescribed times. Right? So we don't have the option if we are um, practicing Muslims to pray whenever we feel like it only. There are, there, are, there are set times during the day, and they're spread pretty much balanced and equally throughout the day. And they line up with uh, certain natural phenomena. So there's this cosmic connection also with the times that we pray. Uh, and the prayer itself. So the Fajr or the Subah prayer at dawn, right? Just the beginning from the darkness starting now into the light of the new day. And the Dhuhr prayer at uh, commencing at when the sun is the highest in, its, in the horizon, at its zenith, right after that. And the Asr prayer um, when the sun has um, you know, descended, not li literally, but descended in the horizon to almost some hours before the sunset. And then the sunset, obviously, Maghrib is at Maghrib. And then the Isha, when the leftover remnants, either of the redness or the whiteness of the horizon, have dissipated, now it's completely dark. And so they, they all have these specific, and, and incidentally, each prayer has its specific talween as well, as we mentioned earlier. So you're going to get something out of Fajr prayer 
that you don't get out of Zuhur prayer. And if you're a person who consistently prays Fajr, but you pray it after you wake up, after sunrise, you'll be not getting the same thing. It's Qadha, inshaAllah, and you have a, technically you have a uh, Sharia uh, dispensation because you were asleep. However, you will not get the same thing in the Qadha, in the makeup, as you would get it in the Ada, as if you did it at the time when it was still dark out. And, you know, the Qur'an describes the Qur'an al-Fajr kana mashhuda. Quran al Fajri, kana mashhuda. The Quran in the Fajr, in other words, the prayer in the Fajr is mashhud. It is being witnessed. Of course, all the prayers are being witnessed. But there's a type of khususiyah, there's something specific about the Fajr prayer that maybe not in the other prayers. The Hadith al Bukhari kind of confirms this meaning when it says that there are mala'ika of the day and mala'ika of the night. Angels of the day and angels of the night. And some come at the Fajr prayer while you're praying, and then others will come at the Asr prayer while you're praying. So it's like a shift. So some say the Asr prayer is Salatul Wusta, the middle prayer. And then the Qur'an al-Fajr, others say the, Qur the Fajr is the Wusta prayer or the middle prayer. Or here it could also mean that it's, uh, you know, the, the, the prayer of the, of the day, coming, uh, night coming into the day. وَكَانَ مَشْهُودًا right? It is a witness prayer by that particular group of angels. So these cosmic connections, specifically to the times of prayer, uh, cannot be denied. Uh, they are extremely, extremely important. So, um, if the prayers then, which is the most important ibadah, the most important act of worship, are spaced out in that particular way, right, to give a rhythm to our day, right, traditional, traditional Muslim peoples, the rhythm of the day is certainly focused around the prayer. You know, people wouldn't say, I'll meet you at 2 o'clock. They'd say, I'll meet you after Asr, or after Zuhur, or let's do it after Isha. Right? And they didn't do that so that they can be, you know, um, dodgy with the exact time. No, because that's, that's when people got together and that's when they would see one another. And so the rhythm of the day kind of focused uh, around that. So if it's so important for the prayer, then I think it's also important for other things. So to do things, and I think I've read in, in, in articles and things like that by so-called experts, that to do things it's consistently at the same time every day um, will help you achieve that thing. I didn't talk about, I want to talk about sleep, which came in time management, but sleep is one of those things too. To sleep consistently at the same time, wake up at, at the same time. Um, my doctor friend, Dr. Yasser is nodding, so I think that's okay to say that. He agrees that you uh, sleep uh, consistently at the same time every day and wake up at the same time. You know, to build these also routines into your day that become the source of blessing and barakah. Because barakah means even something small, but you, the, the thing that comes out of it, the blessing come out of it, is big. So, you know, we want to litanize our time. So obviously the obligatory acts of worship, um, the daily voluntary acts of worship as, as well. If we can do the rawatib or the nawafil that are, um, are done at the same time, you know, between uh, between Dhuhr and after Dhuhr, before Dhuhr and after Dhuhr, after Asr, uh, before Asr, sorry, uh, after Maghrib. So these these rawatib or these nawafil, um, also to try to do them, if we intend to do them, try to do them consistently. That's why I say to people, don't do them all at once. You want to introduce your, your, let's call it your strategy, is to introduce acts of worship, voluntary ones, in as much as you can be consistent with them the rest of your life. That should be the goal. So, if you're doing the five prayers, good, then you can think about maybe Al-Witr, which is the next most important one. If you're not doing the five prayers, then focus on the five. Get that consistent. Don't th think about the other prayers yet until you do the five uh, obligatory prayers consistently um, and pretty much effortlessly, and, and Allah will give you that, inshaAllah. Then, then we can think about other things. And Halu Majarra, uh, and other things as well. So, um, I wrote here also, daily stress relievers. Very important. So, many of us, we work in very high-pressure environments, jobs, whether it be in the medical field or in the corporate world or uh, education. Actually, there's nothing that's not high-pressure anymore, I think. You know, there's no really no laid-back job, I think, uh, as it were. So we need to have built in within our routines ways to relieve um, that stress uh, or, or coping mechanisms. 
And you know, one of the things that our teachers tells us is that sometimes you need to change the environment. Right? You just need to step out. Either step out of a room, step out of a particular space that you're in, and even better would be to step into something that is peaceful, that is serene, like somewhere outside, something of nature, taking walks. You know, people used to take walks much more consistently than, than we do today. And unfortunately, many of our cities, especially in North America, are not really designed for people to, to walk that much. You actually usually have to drive somewhere uh, to take a walk, right? like in a park or something like that. Um, but you know, that's, you know, the foot traffic is another, that's another space that people were meeting, right? When people took walks, they were just kind of casually run into each other. It's also good physically, right, to, to be moving, and it's good to, to change. Um, uh, you know, change the scenery, uh, the scenery. And also they say that uh, sleep also does this as well. You know, so having consistent sleep. Even Imam uh, Shafi said, Ja'a wird in nawm. That the wird, the litany of sleep has come upon me. So he treated sleep just like he treated his hizb, you know, the Qur'an he would read every night. He knew that sleep was important. And he would have an intentionality behind sleep. Right? He knew that he needed to sleep in order to be ready to do the other things. And you know, the woman mentioned in the hadith who would uh, tie a, a rope between two poles and then like, literally hold herself up so she can pray. The Prophet said, what's the point of that? Don't do that. If you're tired, go to sleep. And then if you wake up, you can pray. So you know, we don't have, alhamdulillah, we don't have this sort of... Um, uh, belaboring sort of approach to uh, to ritual acts of worship. You do them when you're in a state to do them, right? And if you're not in a state to do them, if they're voluntary, then you don't do them, and then wait for when you are in a state to do so. So sleep can be an ibadah. Sleep can be an act of worship. And when we talk about intentionality, I don't know if we're going to get to it. We're not going to get to it tonight, but uh, next time. Um, if you have, there's many intentions you can have behind sleep, and one of them could be that Renewal, refreshment. Um, it could be also liqa uh, al-ahbab. This is a place where you can meet all your loved ones. This is a place where you can meet your, the Prophet Sallallahu in your sleep. So there's so many different intentions you can have that you can treat sleep as something you almost look, you know, you look forward to it obviously after a long day and you want to rest, but there are things and kind of uh, spiritual developments that could happen even while you are asleep. So, um, daily stress relievers. Maybe there's also certain people you speak to, friends that you can uh, ring on the phone and uh, you know, who, who will hap have that kind of effect on you as well. Um, and then I would also say the two most important things in terms of how we can better organize the time as outside of the five prayers is to concentrate on the two bookends. So that would be the morning immediately after waking up and your sleep routine or evening, including the bedtime routine. So we usually think, oh, bedtime routine, like my children, I'm going to read them a bedtime story. And then, you know, we pay so much attention to the children, make sure they sleep on time and they get the proper sleep. But as adults, I don't see the same level of attention, right? People can stay up, you know, watching Netflix or whatever they're doing and um, on the internet and getting all of this really unproductive stimulation and then they want to go to sleep after that and their mind is in a million places and it's um, I think one of the um, um, kind of uh, lifestyle difficulties people are contending with now is is insomnia and lack of sleep and not having proper sleep and that sort of thing so I think it's it's uh, it's critical and one way to help with that is focus on your mornings so you know the first hour that after you wake up is really critical about how you spend it and I recommend to not look at your phone uh, not look at your emails not look at anything like that not see what messages you got even though it's very tempting um, but to spend it in uh, meditation spend it in ibadah spend it in dhikr or even spend it in a type of uh, structured silence right or contemplation um, I think it will, will do a lot for you for the whole rest of the day more than than you can possibly imagine and then the evening the same thing there should be a winding down period uh, I recommend for people with children or even if they don't have children that there should be sort of um, 
you know, like at a certain time, we just stop using phones and technology and all that, you know, whether it's going to be 9 p.m. or 8.30 p.m. or whatever people decide. It's very difficult to do, but you need to be able to do it yourself before you then ask the rest of the family. That's also another thing. So when we talk about relationships, and uh, you may have now become enlightened to a different way of life and you're kind of all gung-ho about it, but you can't really coerce anybody else. So you have to show them by example and gently uh, and uh, you know nurture them into it rather than saying, okay, here's a new, here's a new deal. Um, internet's going to be turned off at 10 p.m. Because actually, I've tried that. It doesn't work. So um, you have to, <laughs> you know, big opposition. Anyway, so, but you have to do it in a way to, for people to see, like, OK, that makes sense. Let's do this together. Or let's try this together rather than like this kind of coercion uh, thing. And once you do that, I think, inshallah, you will see a lot of benefit with um, you know, introducing these small incremental changes consistently over time have a much greater cumulative effect on your well-being than just doing something once in a big way and then not doing it after that. You know, an example they use is the constant drip uh, will penetrate the rock after some time, but you, you give it a, you know, a big whirl of the faucet all at once for 20 minutes, it'll do nothing. So um, uh, we have to look at these things, and, and life has more of a marathon, it's not a sprint. So you pace yourself. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَنْ يُشَهَدَ دِينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَةٌ فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا سَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا وَاسْتَعِينُوا Then he mentioned the three times, right? بِالْغَضْوَةِ وَالْرَوْحَةِ وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّرْجَةِ So no one will be able to, إِنَّ الدِّينَ لَا يُسْرِ He said the deen is ease, it's facilitated. وَلَنْ يُشَهَدَ دِينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَةٌ And no one will try to do too much or try to overcome everything except it will overcome him. فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا So the tasdeed and the taqrib means fill in the gaps as much as you can. وَقَارِبُوا And be approximate. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect that the way you think it's going to be. And then وَاسْتَعِينُوا Right? And seek aid in these things by الْغَدْوَةِ وَالْرَوْحَةِ وَشَئِنَ الْدُرْجَةِ الْغَدْوَةِ is the time after Fajr until sunrise. The critical time as we said. وَالْرَوْحَةِ Which means some time that is before Maghrib. This is called the Roha, after Asr, before Maghrib. And then the night, he said something of the night. Could be the beginning of the night, could be of the middle of the night, could be towards the last sixth of the night. Also, there's a hadith warda fi hadha shat, talking about the meritorious nature of the last sixth of the night. There are cosmic connections to these times of day, just like there's a cosmic connection to Ramadan. Ramadan is a special time because Allah made it a special time. And the last sixth of the night is a special time because Allah made it that way. And the Qur'an of the Fajr is special because Allah designated it this way. And so we go in there w with that intention, with that ihtisab, right? Now with Allah, iman and wahtisaban. Iman and we believe in it, and ihtisab, that we do it lil imtithal. We do everything because Allah designated it this way. Without seeking anything else, not because He's going to reward us or give you these things or make things easy, but we have enough of a uh, confidence and a certainty in Allah's decree and what He has designated that it's enough for us to know that, to, to follow that particular time or to seek out this particular time uh, and so forth. So, um, so we've gotten into the next hour. So I know people might have some questions. So I'm going to stop here, inshallah. Barakallah fikum. And we will continue next time uh, with this topic. Barakallah fikum. Jazakumullah khair.